you know, Jeff will be facilitating, but I was just waiting for you, and then we can start recording. So, yeah, okay. Good evening. We'll call this workshop to order. Let us have a moment of silence, followed by the pledge led by Mr. Colton. Please call the roll. Kyrie McCoy. Here. Edward Canuti. Here. Lachey Brooks. Julius Wiggum. Renee James. Here. Brian Colton. Reed Davis. Present. Kimberly Jackson. Here. Arthur Hamilton. There is a quorum. Um, would the board like to uh, give Ms. Jackson voting rights for tonight? Certainly, but that, that, that's not a decision of uh, a motion. That doesn't require a motion, does it? Uh, no, it's by the chairperson. Certainly. Certainly. Uh, any additions and deletions? Good evening, Jeff Gagnon, Planning Zone Administrator. Uh, we have no additions or deletions to tonight's agenda. Um, however, I did want to let the board know that there is uh, a memo included uh, that uh, gave a response back to the motion made by the board last meeting on the year's 11th. Mm -hmm. Any comments on the minutes? If you will, staff, please. Make a motion to approve the minutes as presented. So moved. Properly moved and second. Will you call the roll, please? As a point of order, who uh, made the motion? I did. Thank you. Renee James? Yes. Marie Davis? Yes. Brian Colton? Yes. Kimberly Jackson? Yes. Edward Canuti? Yes. Tragic McCoy? Yes. Motion passes unanimous. Thank you. Unfinished business. <coughs> oh, no unfinished business contacts, Jeff. Okay, we can move right into new business, Mr. Mr. Jeff. Uh, yes, once again, Jeff Gag, and thanks on the administrator. Um, tonight we have Gave you notice here from Treasury Coast Regional Planning Council, um, who has worked extensively on um, the language just presented. Everyone does have a hard copy, I believe, up to say it. As discussed last meeting, it is extensive, and staff do not anticipate the board to um, make any motion in regards to the site tonight. Um, so feel free to ask any questions. More of a exploratory meeting, I guess, due to the of this language. Um, in addition to that printout, every board member should have a copy of the downtown regulating plan, which implements the language as described. Um, at this point, I would like to introduce Ms. Good evening. I recognize some of you from the workshops that we had um, on this land development code a couple of years ago. Um, I think that it's important to understand the concepts behind what this code is proposing, but also um, how we've come to bring such an extensive rewrite to you. 
Um, this is really uh, the final aspect of implementing the Citizens Master Plan. For those of you that participated, that was um, the result of an extensive public um, charrette that was held in 2008. Uh, to this date, it holds the record for the most public participation of any charrette the Treasury Post has had. Um, as a guide, that charrette master plan has guided the adopted new CRA plan. Um, it guided the comprehensive plan amendments that were adopted in 2010. And now it seeks to guide uh, the land development code. The study area, the application area, um, that is the same as the master plan, um, which is basically the boundaries of the CRA. And for those of you that participated, you may remember this, this drawing. Um, and again, this is the, the guiding reference point for all of these changes that you see before you. Why do we even need new districts? Um, there is a couple of reasons. Um, the, the code that you have in place today does not guarantee a physical outcome that is consistent with the vision that was um, adopted after that process. Um, the code that is before you places a greater emphasis on built form and a lesser focus on specific use regulation. Uses are mixed in, in many instances in a way that was not under the current land development code. Um, there's an effort to coordinate private development that would be forthcoming with investments in public infrastructure. Um, in order to be business friendly, a streamlined approval process is part of this equation. By having more prescriptive land development regulations, you enable a faster approval process because there's less up to question as proposals come through and um, things can be handled more administratively. And then, there are issues too that, while well, certain uses are okay in many places, the intensity and scale of the built form that would house them needs to be different. For example, between Broadway versus the Main Street character of Avenue E, those are different streets, even though they allow a lot of the same uses. And there are transitions that need to be resolved there. Um, currently, in many instances where uses and building form are changing across streets, which means your neighbor doesn't um, isn't the same type of building or intensity of use that you have. And in general, those transitions should happen inside and rear property lines so that like building space like buildings. So there's a number of, of things that um, are basically seeking to be resolved by these, this package. The current land development code allows a number of possibilities. Um, parking can be behind a building, the setbacks are minimum setbacks, in some cases they're rather large. There's very little coordination required between buildings. Uh, the larger the parcel that you, that you have, the more building you can build, but the more it sets back, it becomes something that looks very um, familiar in terms of um, the building that the CRA is housed in, for example. And then when structured buildings come in, um, there's very little guidance in terms of the architecture, but the size of the structure planning and, and aspects of that. And so if you look at Broadway today, it's not it's actually fairly predictable that what comes out of the ground is not very predictable. So these are the factors that this code is trying um, to improve. So it is what is often called a form-based code in that it addresses things like building placement. Instead of a minimum setback on some streets, there's a maximum setback. So you know exactly where the building is going to land. Um, where parking is placed, the quantities are adjusted. Um, in many cases, parking is, is largely reduced the requirement. Um, building height is something that everybody can understand, whether you know, you're an architect or a planning board member or simply a resident of the city. People understand how tall a building is by number of stories. And so, that regulation is in place not simply by feet. And then again, the coordination of, of street design with how private development will, will marry that is the main focus. This is why there's not an expectation necessarily that there will be a vote tonight. Uh, this is a real city with very many different uses. And there are five different districts that are in front of you. There are new districts. In many cases, they will replace existing districts. The commercial marine district will be replaced 
place by the downtown rain district. But again, as I said before, it's not just about uses. It's also about scale and intensity. So the buildings that are lining Broadway may be different than the buildings that line on the main. Those five districts are mapped, so it's very clear where they'll be, they'll be applied. Um, if we zoom in, you see some of the differences that I was talking about before, that a long street, the same district, is facing the same street. So here you have the downtown core district is the red, the purple district is the downtown general, which is a lower scale mixed use district. There's a little bit of industrial between the port and the neighborhood that is north of the port. Um, and then the downtown rain district as well. And then there is a, a residential district. And I'll just briefly go through the main concepts and talk details as you desire. Um, in terms of height, this was a very big issue during the charrette, how high it was too high. There's a lot of space downtown to fill. Um, and so the recommendation on the back report was that buildings fronting Broadway would remain in the four to six story range with some opportunities to go higher in key locations. You'll see on page 12 that that directly comes through in this code. It's is basically four stories. And then there are other mechanisms to allow buildings to go to six with the provision of closets and park space and certain key locations where a gateway feature might be appropriate to go to eight stories. And that's in the red district. So the downtown core, which is the, which is the body of downtown largely, basically absorbs the commercial general district. It adds in residential uses by right, and there are some changes to the marine uses that are allowed in order to foster that industry downtown. The downtown general district is that sort of lower main street that is appropriate for Avenue E. It's a more of an office professional, neighborhood commercial, and multifamily is allowed in that district as well. Downtown Marine is the new commercial marine district. There are certain changes that are included, specifically exterior boat storage will be permitted at something the industry needs. And then construction, um, more intense construction consistent with what Tracker Boys operations do today is permitted closer to the port. Um, downtown Industrial, um, the main challenge there for those of you who participated in the charrette was how to improve that transition between the port and the neighborhood to the north. And so that industrial district that comes through has requirements for the face along 11th Street. And to um, facilitate that, there are new uses that are added into that district. And then lastly, the residential district, which allows for a number of choices depending upon the size of the property. Um, single family houses are still permitted. Opportunities for townhomes. Apartment houses and courtyard buildings are also um, allowed in that district under this. Now, one of the main organizing strategies in this code is when you see on the regulating plan some of these streets that are heavier than others that are lighter. That's the, that indicates whether or not the street is considered a primary street or a secondary street. And what that does is tell you the streets that are expected to be more lively and pedestrian friendly, that's where you put your A face, that's where you put the front of your building. And then there's release valve, because this is a real city. This isn't a development that's coming in all at once, all well coordinated. This is a real city. And you have service uses, and you have parking, and you have to take the trash out, and you have things that have to happen. Those looser standards are organized so that neighboring properties are now working together to achieve that organization. And um, we have the ability to, you know, hold tight in some areas because you can be loose on the other side of the property. This is how that works. Um, for example, if this is a street in West Palm Beach, this is an A street, and so the parking garage was not allowed to come all the way forward to the sidewalk. There had to be an active use along the sidewalk instead. This is actually a picture of our building in Stewart. Um, this is a B street condition where parking can come up to the sidewalk, but there are some requirements in terms of the shielding and how the landscaping is handled to still make it a pleasant experience, but the face of the building is somewhere else. That same strategy can be used in all of the districts, carefully, um, 
the marine industry now has employed in some areas minor buildings so that when a, this type of use is facing homes, it's maybe held to a higher standard in the future, um, either through active uses or landscaping and park space, versus the other side, which clearly, you know, can handle a little more um, disarray and is needed to. So you put your best things for your A Street, and then you can um, have a place for the other things that are necessary. And then finally, I put the Broadway section up. There was a lot of concern and discussion for a long time about how to achieve all of the things that Broadway is envisioned to have, including a landscape median, on-street parking, um, just a better urban feel. And so this gives you an idea how the requirements for how the buildings can will meet the street, coordinate with what's happening in uh, the street design. And in this case, there is a special provision to allow and encourage on-street parking to be added over time as new development happens. So this is the sort of the general idea. Because the physical standards for buildings are being raised, um, there is an addition to the existing non-conformities in the code. Making sure everybody knows if your building does not adhere to these and it was lawfully constructed in the first place, you are not being asked to do anything just because the code changed. You will be legally in existence. So nobody has to change anything now, but it will organize future development. And I did want to let you know that the marina plan that has just been approved um, for that district in the public marina does need to be in the infrastructure type of infill that will hopefully begin to happen over time. Um, fortunately, it was able just to be tested because of the parallel projects underway. So remember this test that I showed you at the beginning, um, just as an idea of how the core would start working. Um, parking access and coordination between buildings can gain a little bit more. You can start shaping the streets with the faces of buildings and windows to start creating um, a, um, an interesting walking experience and maximize the potential for parking. And then the buildings that are taller are taller and provide a little bit of relief, but not in the form of just residual leftover buffers, actually in the form of usable public open space. Um, so that's as much as I've prepared for today because it is a lot of information. It's the first time that this board is talking about it. So I figured we would, I have the document. I can pull it up page by page if you prefer. Um, some of you, again, I know helped workshop this a year or two ago. So I think it's fine. Thank you. And I apologize. Give me your name again for the record because I don't even, yeah, I, I heard true. you. <laughs> One more time. It's Anthea Genovis. If you don't mind, spell it no for problem. me. No problem. A-N-T-H-E-A. And then get ready. It's G-I-A-N-N-I-O-T-E-S. And I'm from Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council. Oh, I got that part. All right. <laughs> uh, colleagues, is there any questions for Ms. Anthea before? I have a question. Um, are you changing any of the green space requirements? Are you going to require more green space in the new buildings, in the new properties? Yes. There, um, there is a clear requirement for properties that are over a certain size. And we'll see if I can show you the page. Um, so it's on page, sorry, uh, 46. Starts talking about the amount, the location, but more importantly, what, ha what has traditionally happened in Florida over time is the leftover space tends to be just a buffer or it's this little grassy area that doesn't amount to much. And so, what this code does is start putting design criteria into that space to form it into an amenity. And even if it's coming in as part of private development, this code makes it publicly accessible during daylight hours. It's part of that requirement. So, um, the requirement is, I believe, it's 5% of the size of the site for parcels that are one acre or more in size. Right, okay. And um, there are certainly options that can be chosen by the developer, too. We're, we're not, it's not a one-size-fits-all. 
um, page 47 shows different ideas. Um, but there's a green, a plaza, which is more hardscape, playground, where is the hot train. There's a, there's a variety to choose from with how that space is shaped. So this is not necessarily grass green no. space. It could be asphalt. It could be hardscape. Absolutely. Ms. Davis? Yes. Mr. Colton? I have uh, approximately eight points to bring out and from reading page three. Um, it talked about the community development director making the decision of approving or disapproving. And after that, if someone wants to appeal it to come before the board, right. would it be feasible to have a committee along with that director approving or the committee looking over, not necessarily appointed board, but people who are, is it just a director himself that looking it over and approving, disapproving, or would it be feasible to add a committee in just as a buffer because more eyes are better than one? Right, I think um, right now there are certain constructions and certain changes that can happen on a daily basis to any property that is simply achieved by pulling a building permit. Um, this seeks to add a lot more description to the type of, of buildings that are coming in, so that's part of why the code is important, it's really for, for all of us to be comfortable with, with what it's going to yield. Um, because the idea is, in terms of being business friendly and in terms of um, having got the guiding document that was started in 2008 is that you would be able to streamline those approval process and not have a, co a, a separate committee beyond your staff um, reviewing those things. Now, if there's a disagreement with the interpretation of, of Ms. McKinney, well, the community development director at that point, then it goes through the process that you have now in terms of the ZBA. So it's the staff as a whole, basically. Right, it, it allows those a lot of a lot more improvements and development to happen through the building permit process rather than through an extensive review, you know, that that can be unpredictable in terms of time and outcome. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, page six also um, it shows pictures of parking and parking is um, part of it goes with against count as a store, uh, as a height, as one story? Has there been any consideration, basically, because if a developer comes in and says, I want to do underground parking, has anyone considered underground parking? And it doesn't necessarily have to be 20 feet on the ground. It could be eight, and then it, it gets covered up where you don't see that. Would that be considered as one story, or has that been considered as part of this process? Okay, I see what you're saying. I think this could be a little more clear. And point number not on um, number six, excuse me. It says that if the floor is more than five feet above the sidewalk, it counts, but it doesn't clearly say that um, stories that are wholly underground are not counted for the purposes of height. I can add a clarification to okay. that. Okay. Um, page eleven talks about color. Earth tone. Now, would it be, what, why I'm reading into this, um, I don't want the interpretation of someone to say an earth tone may be green. Is there a color scheme basically that, and I'll take Key West for an example, where right. you have coral colors that are specific. How would you describe that, that process? Well, for those of you who worked on this in the past, that was a major source of concern. Okay, so I'm not surprised that's being raised again. Um, we uh, had drafted in the last version a much more extensive color regulation. It, you know, we have a whole color fan and you can use from these and not from those and this and not from that. And really the concern was that this language is actually, the earth tone pastel language is already in effect on the arterial design standards that the city's already using, and the staff at least felt very comfortable that that had been enough 
rather than this really complicated color scheme that someone has lost to you. Um, so I think it just becomes difficult because if we, right now, there's not a building permit required to approve paint color. And so by having that requirement, we're kind of inadvertently concerned about making a hardship, particularly for small businesses and you know, just residential property owners. And so kind of went back and forth on how much was too much and how much was enough. So. I, my only concern with that is if you have a business owner that most all the buildings around have somewhat earth tone colors and a person wants to put in a bright pink someplace it wouldn't fit the color scheme. That's my concern with that. That's telling her to okay. On page 45, we talked about trees should be specific within the comprehensive plan to it. Trees being planted by the roadway and in the roadway basically as a green space. Um, my concern with trees, uh, I do think that you should be specific with the canopy trees because some trees, you put canopy trees per se, have an aggressive root system that could damage future drainage and or roadways. So I think there should be some specific when it comes to the type of canopy trees. Yeah. And on page 49, it, there's a correction that you have to back. back. I'm so happy you read it. I can't tell you. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank
We don't have any plans for any additional taxing districts. One idea in the future is we might need to treat stormwater on a district-wide basis. There is the potential to create some sort of extra tax related to areas that would be captured in that district, but that's well down the line. So right now there's no future tax districts other than what exists right now. And is there a need to plan for parking at a CRA question? We are looking at doing metered parking in our Marina District redevelopment area, but not along Avenue E or anywhere else in the CRA at this point. Possibly Ocean Mall in the future. So that's not something you'd want to put in here? No. Thank you. Is there any more questions for Ms. Anthea on the presentation? Yes. Ms. Hamilton. On the same page where you have the trees in front of the structures, could the trees go on the property and designate that tree area for parking? That's a very close to the system that's there now. And the intent was really just to try to start getting those tree-lined avenues where it's very shaded, it's easy to walk, those types of things to start getting that enclosure. The sections that are here would be only in effect if development came in, which is more likely to happen in the core areas, I think, than in the areas that are single family, and necessitated changing the streets. The other use for this I think is important to report in terms of Northern Florida and it's hot and it's nice to have trees and we're in a dense urban area where reducing urban heat indexes can be facilitated by trees, is that by setting a vision for that can help determine about the CRA and other people who are making investments. We really need to plant 60 trees on the street somehow. Things like that where you know what you're striving to achieve in terms of the neighborhood. Certainly this part of the code speaks only to what is happening within the public area, which is between those dashed lines. It does not certainly prevent or change the rules for landscaping on private property right now. Is there any other questions? Mr. Kanuti? How are you today? One question you mentioned in your opening statement about how were you streamlining the approval process. How is the approval process being streamlined different than what's happening now? In terms of planning and development strategies and things like that that are in place for larger projects, it removes the necessity for moving through that as long as the project is meeting what is in this code. I think another good example of methods of streamlining are to point out specific areas within the regular plan. Not to be printed out, which is north of Blue Heron Boulevard, both the east and west sides, there is a red dotted area on both sides of Broadway. And what those are, are the pre-approved areas of the plan for those parcels to try to entice development and show property owners and future developers what they are looking for. And if they can come relatively close to what that design criteria is asking for, it's something that will absolutely streamline and sort of be a process. That's one aspect. The text related to that is on page 55 of the code. I'd actually, sorry, thank you for that. Those areas were also identified in the comprehensive plan amendments that moved forward in advance of this effort. 
um, they were areas that are under are large parcels under ownership that if they turn over, a, a major proposal would come in at once. And so to be in front of that rather than reactive to it, that was one. Those were areas that were pre-planned. So essentially what you're saying is if somebody comes to the table with what we want in that area, we're going to put them on a fast track pace to, uh, to get that. Which leads me to another question I had in that general area you just referred to, uh, Jeff. Uh, there's, a, there's a big, there's two trailer parks there. And I can't remember what page it was on, but I think we are including trailer parks into the code as part of an allowable, uh, an allowable use. Did I read that correctly? Because uh, my question is this, I mean, on Broadway, I'm not sure that's, you know, the highest and best use of, uh, of city, uh, the city resource. And secondly, shouldn't that, tra the trailer park that's on Broadway, shouldn't that become a non-conforming use so that if anything happens there, I mean, it's not going to, they're not going to build more trailers. I don't know the specific area you reference. I don't know if you have a page number that we can look at. But I, I can't remember the page number, but there was some reference that uh, trailer park wasn't allowed to use. Okay. And uh, I guess my question is, yeah. I, I don't agree with that. And I think that it should become non-conforming once this is approved. I, I think the intent of the language is we'll go back and review. Um, do a word search. So you're saying as long as it's a trailer park, it's a trailer park. But once it, they want to do something else, it's not conforming, so they got to meet the code. That, that was my understanding of this document. We can, we can go back. And okay. Well, this, uh, just a clarification then. One question on uh, so many of the buildings uh, along Broadway are so close to the street, you know, just evolutionary, you know, as it was a two-lane road from one uh, at one time to now a four-lane road with a turning lane. So these buildings are so close. If anybody does any major renovation to those, uh, uh, does that become a non-conforming use? And are they then uh, required to meet the code? At the point at which they are required to bring the code up has not changed and, and as it stands now for the code as a whole, which is 50% of the value. Right. I'm guessing 50%. it's standard that's 50% of the value. Um, you'll notice on uh, page 12, which is the downtown core district, uh, the setbacks, there are specific setbacks for Broadway with the minimum and a maximum that uh, will maintain that Main Street feel, but give a little more air in front for a nice wide sidewalk and room for everything that's happening in front of those buildings. Just a, a point of clarification for myself. Uh, on page 17, uh, we have uh, item number three, fueling stations. And uh, the way I read it, that the two fueling stations or gas stations on Broadway are non-conforming. Am I be correct in that assumption? The two or the one at Blue Heron? The one at Blue Heron, uh, pretty obvious. But the one also on uh, the uh, 13th Street. Because the pumps are right on the street, there's no buffer, no uh, retail buffer between them. So I'm, I, I, just a point of clarification. So those would be non-conforming. If anybody's going to do anything there, they then have to conform. Right. Legally non-conforming. Legal, right. Legally non-conforming. Yeah, legally non-conforming. Not legally. Okay. Yeah. Is that it, Mr. Kennedy? Uh, no. Okay, a couple more. The uh, uh, without starting a, uh, an environmental war. 
Parking seems to be the biggest problem that we've got, you know, listening to the, to the, you know, the various merchants. And uh, I noticed that in the landscape pl parking landscape plan, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of landscaping in the parking. And uh, each of those little segments of landscape of uh, landscaping uh, really use up about three and a half parking spaces. And I guess my question is, are there any alternatives to that? I mean, whether it be you know art art design or something something of that nature, so that we squeeze in a little bit more parking, and you know maybe sacrifice wrong word, uh, maybe not have as much green, but something something decorative that offsets that. Well, I think one thing to, that I'd like to point out is that the, um, the landscaping solution that you see in the diagram shows two options, but you only have to do one. So you provide either the islands every 10 spaces, like you see it here, which means you would not need to do all of this here. Or just because of the configuration and size of certain lots, it's easier to do just one consistent just because the depth of your lot is a certain size, it's much easier to do that and not give up the landscape things. What is here is actually less than the current code requires. What's out on the ground today is, is not what the current code requires in this, most, most places because it's mostly asphalt without any landscaping except at the perimeters. So the landscape regulations are reduced from what the current code is now, but they are higher than certainly what is typical out there now. Uh, the other point about um, parking and efficiency and maximizing building potential, Scott Evans mentioned um, getting a whole, a whole stormwater management system for downtown. This is something that Treasure Coast has raised repeatedly with the city because we think that is so important. Because what you'll see now with some of the new development that comes in ends up with a depressed grassy area for holding water. And that's getting up a lot of potential commercial space, parking to support commercial or residential spaces. And so while I think it's important to, you know, I agree with you, backs are backs and we can get there. Um, we can look, I, I'll look at it again and see, compare it to other places that are built. But I think in terms of maximizing parking and space, that's why when it comes back up eventually, just remember that getting that, that retention area off of the individual parcels is probably a much larger issue for that. Sure, no, no question about it. But <coughs> still, uh, in, in the current code, it, or the current plan, uh, you know, uh, square footage is square footage. Right. You know, if you plant trees and grass, you can't put a car there. Okay. So, you know, uh, and I think, I think the parking is gonna be critical, a uh, critical issue. As far as Broadway is concerned, my understanding is pretty much that's a done deal. I mean, uh, as far as uh, what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I mean, we really don't have much of an alternative to do anything on, you know, from the flyover to Silver Beach Road. In terms of on-street parking, well, uh, on anything. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, it's a DOT project that's locked in. Right. You know, and uh, are we are we uh, approaching it that, that this is a done deal and these regulations kind of complement or, you know, uh, kind of work around it or find loopholes in it or, what, you know, whatever? Well, there are a couple of, couple of parts. I think physically what's coming out of the ground now is certainly what's going to happen now. There is a block that the city owns that on street parking was added to the program and, and at least that block when the street is finished will have it. Um, the community development director and DOT have agreed, however, that as major projects come in, and there are a lot of large property owners that border um, Broadway beyond um, the Sierra and Viking, the Drybovich and others, um, who when they're ready to redevelop, you know, have indicated that they are certainly amenable to um, putting the on-street parking in, and DOT has indicated to the city that those retrofits would be permitted later. So it's not going to happen all at once, but it, 
it could happen over time in some places. And certainly didn't want to give it up because it is so important for merchants to have that visibility. So. Sure, sure. I mean, are we offering incentives for people to do that as they redevelop it, or is it just a voluntary thing? Um, right now, the setback and the space that is left um, ensures that there's room. Um, I need to read whether it's required or whether you're just required to give the space. When they do the construction of the space, I need to check that. Uh, now that I got the environmentalists up uh, on the landscaping, one question. Uh, we focus a lot on bike routes, okay? Through this, uh, through this corridor, and uh, although I like the bike, I mean the bike routes take up probably the equivalent of a lot of parking spaces. So and again, I only say, you know, is there anything you can look at? And uh, you know, I mean, there's a sensible balance there, you know, of uh, where to go. I mean, if the bike route goes to Avenue F, okay, and gets us some parking on Avenue E and Avenue uh, Broadway, you know. It's a little more exercise, or less. Yeah, I don't think the, the current plans for the, the bike route, um, which occurred a few years ago now, um, they originally were scheduled to be along this one on Broadway. Um, however, through discussions with LTFT, a large section of it was actually shifted to Avenue E. So to shift it again. So that would provide uh, basically a more, a more safe avenue for pedestrian use, bicycle use, uh, along the street. And I believe that the future redevelopment plans for Avenue E um, have both incorporated the bike route as well as the uh, park. You're saying Avenue B? E. E. Okay. Right. It's not on Broadway. Right. Initially, that's where it was prepared. No, I mean, that's certainly a step in the right direction, you know. To free up some space on Broadway. Okay, I have no other questions. Actually, I have a question for you, uh, Mr. Gagnon. I don't know if this memo helped me out or confused me even, even further, but it, it clearly says on street parking has been included along US 1. And I thought the motion that we did a couple weeks ago was asking staff to, to look into it to see exactly what, what the status was because I remember. And we brought it up in our last meeting that I, I, I distinctly remember saying I've seen plans that actually had on-street parking, and then you know we came to the conclusion that there's not on-street parking, and I thought that was the entire basis for the motion that directed staff to inquire about that vacant lot. So, is this this the third bullet point on the memo? Right. That was in reference to what we are calling the uh, model lot, which is city owned. So that was just on street parking for that one area of the city. Okay, so at what point is the on street parallel parking going to be utilized during the construction phases? Is that what is that what that um, bullet represents? Well, I guess I could have written it more clearly, but the the existing construction along Broadway um, has incorporated that parallel parking. So if you did drive by today, you can actually see where the cutout is for that parallel parking along that model block between 22nd and 23rd Street. Okay, so it's not in the design of the project. Um, the, the parallel parking was included in the design of the US-1 roadway improvements for the initial phase. So that, as soon as the roadway improvements are done, there will be functional parking in between 22nd and 23rd Street. Okay. Okay. Now, a question for Ms. Antheas? Yes. Anthea, okay. Um, and it goes back to 57 when you guys define uh, legally, well, I guess you may mention of legally non conforming. And my question is this uh, Section 3180, subsection 8. And it starts and says, such uses and or buildings that lawfully existed prior to date of ordinance, but which do not conform with the new pro provisions adopted on that date, shall be deemed to be legally non conforming. And it goes on. But what my question is this, and, and, and I kind of thought we were going that direction when Mr. Canuti was asking his questions. Is sites redevelopment occurs? Now, for instance, in a, in a situation like the trailer park, I mean, what's actually the redevelopment there? Because that's, I mean, trailers are mobile. 
and I don't see that how, how that would be non-conforming because you know the whole redevelopment. What triggers that redevelopment if something was to happen at that trailer park? Is it adding additional trailer home units or reorganizing it, or how does that work? Because another peculiar thing is this: that trailer park within that park, those roads aren't owned by the city. So how does that work? Okay, so just two questions. Um, and I think that that's very astute, that the mobile home park may work a little differently for nonconformity. And I think that's something that we're going to have to bring back to you. Because is it that you cannot add another mobile home? If you have 50, you can't have 51. Is it that somebody moves out and takes their home with them and you can't bring in a new one? So I think that is certainly something that we need to consider the different possibilities and bring back to you. In terms of the redevelopment area, you're exactly right. Um, and, and, and speak to the threshold because okay. it says when redevelopment occurs, what actually constitutes redevelopment? Well, I because think for mobile homes, we're going to have to bring that back to you and, and really clarify what what happens. Well, even for other uses, I mean... For other uses, it's, it's, if it's over 50% of the value of the property now, the repairs or the things that, that are being undertaken are over half of the value. And that's the code now. That's part of why you don't see it here is because what's underlined is what is being added to the Correct. existing code. Correct. So this... Um, you know, you're given a standalone document, but it's part of the other land development regulations, and so you know, try to make it as clear as possible. But um, we, we can bring the existing code language back the next time, so you can see how how it marries into it. In terms of the streets and the right of ways, um, I don't have the images with me. They were something that was included uh, in the comprehensive plan amendments to show the idea of what the master plan had. Um, suggested for these larger parcels that are under fairly unified ownership. And so when you see these dashed lines that are coming in here, um, those are proposals that if these properties redevelop, um, where their new streets and alley systems would be located, uh, there's flexibility in the language. It says very clearly that this can be adjusted at the site plan level. But the idea that there's a grid of streets, that um, existing streets like E are extended through the property, things like that are described um, so that new circulation, whether it's a public street or the circulation of how the parcel is designed, actually marries into your street grid system. And so that's why the regulating plan suggests these things. So if a developer comes in and he looks at, your, at the site and wants to kind of do a new project, you know, there's a description in the comp plan language, and I'll bring that the next time as well. Um, and I believe, of how those, um, how those crop, the characteristics that need to happen. So it starts saying things that um, Avenue E is reconnected through the properties. A system of new streets and pedestrian paths connected facing parcels to each other and to Broadway. So that instead of being a pod, whatever comes in later in the future gets knit into the city as an extension of the city. So those um, those instructions are in the code, and that's part of why they seem very detailed, right? But you can't have that expedited process if if, if the city's not confident of what you're bringing. Because right. if it's going to if it's going to go in a totally different direction, then it does need to come through a more extensive public process. So this is just, if you're going to do it this way, we're going to help you, we're going to streamline you, it's going to be quickly, it's going to happen quickly. If that's not what you're doing, then we're going to have a long chat in public. So. Now, what's the approximate time frame, Ms. Anthea? You said when you bring it back, like, what's the time frame are we looking at, just in ballpark? You're referring to this document in general? Yes. To, yes. Certainly. Uh, if there's nothing else, I want to go to public comments.
Excuse me, Chair. Mr. Hamilton. When she indicated 50% of the value, and this may have been clarified before my arrival, is that 50% of the Palm Beach County property appraisal value? We would rely on the property appraisal's value. And that is clarified somewhere in writing? That is in, I believe it's our typical land development regulations. I'll pull the section of the code that references that. And if it does need to be implemented in this document, we'll do that. Thank you. Anything else? If we will, can we move forward to public comments? Joe Ward. Do we have a clock, staff? Joe Ward, 2135 Broadway. I am glad you announced this. This was the workshop, and the agenda approval confirmed that. And now we see that there is major problems with this document, and it was explained to be an extensive rewrite. There is no way that this board would normally be able to take this to the next regular meeting and approve anything because of the extensive amount of problems. Page 69, section 29-66 deals in alleys. You really have to understand that this thing was developed for major landowners, and it's one reason the CRA is going to fail, because they don't understand Riviera Beach is going to be developed in increments and not assemblage of the entire 858 acres or some big block of it. So the alleys have been cussed and discussed for many months as an extortion, requiring certain individuals to say, well, you can't comply to maintain this. You have two maps which are conflicting and confusing. The downtown regulation plan describes the primary streets and future alleys and alleys. The downtown street type maps goes off on items that don't necessarily even conform consistently, like Broadway is not shown as a state road, yet it is. So there needs to be substantial work to make the two maps equal to each other when people read them. The marina, look at the district, the south 30% is being converted to commercial marine, downtown commercial marine. I don't think you have charter abilities that the judge ordered some specifics, and although the city attorney says that decision is not final, therefore they haven't challenged it, there is a substantial problem with that. 11th Street, why is that a primary street all the way to the railroad? One side is industrial. If you look at the descriptions for this street, and there is a particular page, number 65, that deals in a concept for 11th Street, I don't think you're going to have the industrial that we conceived in the citizen's direct master plan. We're talking big trucks serving the facilities that are adjacent to port. Just because it's the divide shouldn't make this a primary street that has all kinds of restrictions saying that we need narrow travel lanes. You're not going to make it work for the user. The Spanish courts, CRA scammed the commission yesterday with an architectural contract in which they inserted something that's contrary to the city's orders for Spanish courts. The city has made some great plans. I don't know if it's three quarters of a minute, but for Spanish courts, and the CRA wants to convert it to something different and have done it piecemeal by subterfuge. So Spanish courts is conflicting in the district designation here also. 
The next meeting, you need to order that the Treasure Coast send their executive director who is familiar with all of the city's codes. Uh, we have, as Mr. Kennedy started to raise the question, some specifics in the comprehensive plan about what he calls or are called trailer parks. We've got to get out of that name, I think. But we need somebody else here to explain some of this at the next, including having the staff write a memo on every provision in here. Thank you, Mr. Ward. Bessie Brown? She's coming, Ms. Davis. Uh, Mr. Gagnon, do we usually have agendas for the public? Somebody just bought off the sidewalk 
and put them into this beautiful redevelopment area. So I think that, you know, as a board, you know, that perhaps that you all can look at some type, some type of conformity as really uh, what should be considered uh, conformed to a mobile, mobile living in that area. Because I think what we see now, what we see now as a resident, I, don't, I prefer not to see that. So that's, that's one thing that I would like to say. And also the trees. We said in the charrette uh, part about the redevelopment part of this, that uh, we want the trees that are weather resistant that so that they can last. And also to the color, the color codes. Let them be a unified, conform color. Don't don't have just one one over here brown and one over here blue. You know, make it unified so that whole area there. Yeah. You know, when once when we go into our city here, we can see the beautification of it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, sure. If you will, just one second, Mr. Hamilton. Uh, I think. Excuse me, one moment. Ms. Brooks, if you wanted to say something? No. <coughs> okay, let the record reflect Ms. Ms. Brooks has joined us. Now, a question for staff, how does that work? I mean, we're not technically voting on anything. Right, if, if the board were to make a motion, um, being that we have full board, full-time board members are all present now, um, they would take precedent over an alternate member. Um, so at the beginning of the meeting, an alternate member was uh, provided voting rights, being that we did not have Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Canuti, did you have something? Uh, just uh, on the on the prior just on the prior comment about the agenda and backup. Excuse me. Uh, on the, so on the uh, prior comment about the agenda and backup. If we have extensive backup and somebody uh, wants to get a copy of it, uh, is there a procedure for them to call your office and say, I would like a hard copy of the backup for the meeting? Absolutely. If at any time, um, any interested party would like a hard copy, make that available. Um, what we'll do tonight, because there seems to be much more demand and supply of paper and hard copies. Um, once the meeting is concluded, I will run extra copies. Uh, if members uh, of the presidents would like a copy tonight, if not tonight, I can have them available in our offices. Okay, so I'm going to just call your office and request it. Absolutely. Or email it. Okay, thank you. No other questions. All right, Ms. Shepard, this, you, you, you're welcome to speak, but this didn't actually identify this item. Are you speaking on this item? I said public comment. Right, but we're still in on new business item six. But go ahead. I mean, you're welcome to speak on on it. Go ahead. Um, with with uh, regards to um, the charrette, kind of lost my thought as you were talking to me. Um, I'm glad that the charrette has been redesigned and focused on. Because it's important that the new um, design, the, the marina, everything is coming into effect. I really want to make sure uh, that we do. I'm, I'm glad you said it, Mr. Kanuti, because we can't really talk on an item if we don't have uh, the essential backup. And as you can see, we are filling up now because we're so interested in these particular projects. And with the new members uh, coming in intact, um, and the charrette uh, coming in, we want to continue to dialogue with you so we can get an understanding of just how, especially uh, Pinky Avenue and Broadway is going. It seems to be a lot of traffic there. And I definitely want to know how is that going to consistently be uh, focusing in now on the new um, uh, plan for the CRA and that, and that, and that vicinity. So that's really what I want to talk about, and I hope that you guys continue. I, I have to go. I've been in meetings all day. 
I hope that you guys will continuously try to get this particular meeting on channel 18. Now that you have a full board, a very competent board, I think it's important that the residents know exactly what's going on. No news is bad news. And I think we need to have good news. Thank you. Thank you. Norm Mahoney. Good evening, Norm Mahoney, 2120 Broadway. I have a question about the comprehensive plan between the CRA overlay and the comprehensive plan with the city plan. Which one is the one that supersedes what? Because there are two different deviations, what the CRA wants and what the city wants. So this is a question that I'm doubting. Because it's like, I know it's like a puzzle, but they're not going to penetrate the same, so they could be the whole figure. Can somebody answer that question? And before I go farther, you can check, this is 1999. I remember there was a developer that they wanted to develop that area from 28th Street and up. I don't know really what happened, and you were not here at that time. There was another planning and zoning board. They have a beautiful plan. And they were talking about the mobile homes to be like kind of condominium, affordable condominiums, and, and try to place that area much better. So if you can see that plan from 1999, there was a developer from Orlando. I remember he came here, he showed the whole thing, the whole layout. So there is something that you need probably to make that some kind of research in order to see what also the citizens want in the charade. So you have an idea. What is the three parties? The city staff, the CRA staff, the planning and zoning board, and the people, what they really want. So if you place the whole scenario all together, you at least have an idea of what is going on. So my question is, CRA supersedes the city uh, overlay, or the city or the CRA supersedes the city plan? Thank you. that question, the city's comprehensive plan is the master plan for the city. The, um, the CRA area is based within and this new downtown regulating plan and the requirements within are based within that comprehensive plan. So the comprehensive plan will take precedence. Thank you, Mr. Gagnon. Uh, we kind of switched orders and we took board comments first. Is there anything additional until we go on to uh, our general discussion? Ms. Davis? I'm really happy to see so many of the public here, so many of the residents. Um, and I think some of the, their uh, their questions are valid, and they may have already been addressed, or their concerns may have been addressed, but not perhaps not to this particular group of citizens. So if you could, um, for the next meeting, address some of their concerns um, and bring them back to us, that way we'll be more educated and so will they when they come back to our next meeting? Just, just as a point of order, um, for clarity for staff, we would request that you put that in a motion and I guess provide a more detailed description. For example, if you want specific reference to all public comment cards or um, were there specific questions that you feel were unanswered that you'd like staff to respond to? Well, I think that public there were public comments that really weren't questions, but there were if you would review it. I can't tell you exactly what they were, but there were some what appear to be some legit, legitimate concerns. If you could, we well, had to do the minutes anyway. Whatever the questions were, if you could just put a little answer um, down on the minutes. So I'll make a motion that for the next meeting. Um, that there be answers to some of the citizens' concerns. There's been a motion. Is there a second? There's no second. It dies for lack of a second. Let's move on to public comments. Uh, Mary Bram. And while she's coming, Ms. Jackson, you have something? Yes, yeah. sir. I know at the last meeting uh, we had talked about being on channel 18.
did, and you were supposed to go back to staff and, I guess, Ms. McKinney and see the status, regarding the status of that request. Do you have any information on it? First, point of order, it's slightly off topic. Tomorrow I'm incurring a few business items, and I think the board directed it for a slightly different thing as well. But I think it would be more appropriate to revisit that once we get to these point of orders. The reason why I ask is because it came up again as part of one of the comments. I think Ms. Shepard brought it up, so I was just curious to know. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Mayor Graham, Riviera Beach. Apparently, in my general comments, I want to make mention about that same thing. But I would like to also inform the board. Previously, over the past years, that's the same thing that we had asked for also, too, because this board is the most important board in the city. This board here brings it in as well as takes it out. But you as a board, you also have to realize, too, you are in the transitional period here where you want to move this city forward. At this particular point here, a televised with what's being advocated here for the good of this city here in the redevelopment stage would be a critical component for all of the Riviera Beach areas to see on Channel 18, just like the CRA in your general board meetings, because a lot of the residents really, really do not know exactly what is taking place in the city here to help this city here be the city that I know, you know, and everybody else knows what this city could be. So often we've said, how can we get the word out to the general public? How can we get the word out to the general public? Well, your most effective tool is Channel 18. So why not utilize that tool there? This board here conducts its business by the Robbins Rules also. So why not? Why not have this meeting here televised, especially in this phase of this city history? Because in order for us to move forward and do the things that in our redevelopment area, not just this area here too, but also on the west side, it's just things that within this CRA board too that's also being advocated for on the west side so that the residents will know. And as effective board, PNC board members too, I would like that for you all to advocate with your council representatives, whoever nominated you as a board member here, to say that it's okay. To say that it's okay. Because from reading these notes here, was a letter drafted? That's my question. Did anybody draft the letter? Has the letter gone to the city manager? Because it's in your minutes here that four people did vote to have it drafted. So the letter was drafted. I'm asking it. I'm asking that question. So was the letter drafted to the city manager? And let me clear this up because I think that's where we were going with Ms. Jackson. I think I called in and spoke to Brad. And if you can pause her time at about 30 seconds. I called in and spoke to Brad. I think it might have been about a week and a half ago, give or take a couple days. But it wasn't until I got home that I realized that the motion that was made, if you guys look at the minutes, it was to direct me as chairperson to write a letter. But that didn't require a motion. And it kind of got lost. And I am guilty of that. And excuse me for that because I've actually been traveling back and forth to Tallahassee. But when I realized what had occurred, I did initially call in to staff. And I had not had the opportunity to prepare that letter. So, I mean, if I can have my colleagues forgive this as well as the public. But it's been about a week's time. So if you will, please forgive me for that. But I certainly will get on that this weekend. Thank you. And if you have anything additional. And let me ask you this, staff, since we're on this. Why does it have to be a letter from myself? Because I remember we went through this and this is also in the recordings. 
we want to make a, a, a direct motion back to Ms. McKinney because I, I think we went through the whole you know, chain of command. I said, well, when we make a motion, what is the process? And I think that was one of the things that was convoluted because you, know, you reference staff and you have to send it to Ms. McKinney. And I think that's what we got on the point of having the chairperson. I think, Ms. Mm -hmm. Ms. Davis, you were the person that made the motion. Yes. But, I mean, is it the intention of the board to have me to do it? Because I don't think we need a motion for that. I can just, I mean, you can just ask me. But if the direction was to ask staff to do it, then, you know. I think you said we needed a motion. That's why I made the motion. A motion to ask me to do it? That's what he said. That's okay. why I did. That, that was the direction. Yeah. If I recall um, the conversation from last meeting, I think there was dialogue between staff and the board, and the board was seeking the most direct route possible to provide information to both the city manager and city council. Um, it is my guidance and purview to provide any sort of information to my direct supervisor, um, which would include additional staff in relaying that information. It was my understanding that the board felt the quickest possible way of providing that information directly to the council and city manager was through the motion that was developed. So that, that was my reflection of the events. Okay, well, I, I'll tell you what, I, I, to make everyone's hearts clear on it, I'll do the letter tonight, and what I'll do is <clears throat> I'll send it to you, Jeff, just as a, so you can actually put it into our next meeting packet so, you know, we can all have that put behind us and, you know, the formal request is made to council and the uh, city manager. On behalf of the entire board. Thank you. And, 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 and correct me, uh, attorney, because I, I definitely don't want to violate the Sunshine Law in doing this letter and providing a copy. Is, is that appropriate to send it to staff to provide in the next meeting packet? It is appropriate to send it to Mr. Gagnon. Okay, that, that's on the record. Okay. okay. I'm sorry, Ms. Brand, you can continue said, for, for about I, 30 I, I seconds. I wanted that question answered because, like I said, I, I did have some minutes on the clock. It has to be on the <laughs> so, like I said, with this project here, this project is critical for this city. Even if televising this on, on TV, enough for this uh, development area that is going to transpire in our city, I don't care if you decide to take it off there, but this is going to be a make and break for this city. If, if the residents in our city is ill-informed, then everything goes down to two. So you as a board, you as a board, do your due diligence in making this work. Let them know. Everything is not bad about it. And that's where you all come in at. Everything is not bad about it. I have gone through maybe about 100 plans for this city. Maybe more than that. But this this is the do or die of this city here. Not just for you, but for me, as, as the, for the young peoples, the older peoples. I may not live to see it, but it's worth the try. And you as a board must step up to the plate. So I, I encourage you all to advocate. What we ever put you on the board? Tell them. Let it be a time for fear frame, you know, so that the residents can see not just a negative side, but a positive side. And that's what's being seen. And that's what's being heard throughout our community. This is a bad thing. This is a bad thing. So make it work. Make it work. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Thank you. Carol Strick. Environmentalist and for a reality check. I live in Whitehall. We feel the effects of everything that happens in Riviera Beach just like I'm here. I joined the task force because I loved Emma. I love what she stood for. And Emma's main concern was the health of this community. It wasn't the business community. It wasn't profits for a few at the expense of an entire neighborhood, a whole city that's plagued with cancer, plagued with kidney disease, plagued with asthma. The children are all sick. It can't get much worse, but it is. Our place is just behind you. 
when we when I take a walk in the morning at seven o'clock, it stinks from the trucks on 45th Street. You have taken a residential area and turned it into an industrial area. Was that fair to any of us? And all of us, Riviera Beach, parts of Lake Park, or parts of uh, West Palm Beach, where was our input? You're talking about your the the uh, audience. There are ten people here. Ten people from a hundred thousand people. 35,000 here, and the 35,000 who will butt Riviera Beach, north and south. Where is our input? Do the people even know what's going on? They turned around, and the next thing we knew, there was a zillion trucks going back and forth on 45th Street. That diesel fuel is completely rampant. Wherever we walk, we smell diesel fuel. It's getting worse. The water is becoming undrinkable. There's so much chlorine in the water now to kill the effects of all these pollutants that we're basically drinking chlorine, and that's getting worse. This job should have been, and this board should have known, that there was ultimately going to be a limit to this industrialism and a limit to construction, because every brick, every nail, every piece of glass or wood is just compounding this poison. We're doing nothing for the children. The other day I saw a terrific interview on, in front of the Senate. It was two CEOs, Lockheed Martin, hmm, what was he doing there, and Exxon, both concerned about the environment. And all I could think to myself is, their grandchildren who were in college, who know what's going on, saying, Grandpa, why did you do something? Why did you let this happen? Steal our world. This isn't a great plan. A few people are going to profit here, and a neighborhood is getting more contaminated every day. You have to really think about what you're doing and what the priorities are. Is it for a couple of industrialists or a population that deserves better than they're getting? There's too much illness here, and there's just too many people who are pushed out of this lovely picture. Should we paint it green? We'll paint it beige. Who cares? Everybody deserves a chance at having a healthy, fruitful existence, and they have definitely not gotten it thus far. Oh, and let me say I agree with Mr. Ward. Spanish court was in the referendum. All of a sudden, they come up with a plan for Spanish court. We had a plan, and the judge approved it. Everything that's being discussed now is against the referendum. Every point that you're making, we had already discussed, and the judge approved what we said. We wanted a limit to industrialism because we thought that the health of the community, this community, Central West Palm, and Lake Park, were more important than profits for a few. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gerald Ward. Gerald Ward, 31, 2135 uh, Broadway, the south side of the old city hall block, and the memo of 24 April by CDEX Planning and Zoning Administrator really has some problems. Uh, it says the spaces are rarely utilized. How come we have to have the police department down there at St. Mark's or St. George's Church? It's used extensively for feeding folks. And second, they finally got the membership up, so during the church services, it's used also. So uh, it, your idea of more parking down there is something that could be used by a public-type facility, church facility, religious. Uh, the parking spaces in the bullet above are included, are four, Contractors had to tear it up and redo it because either DOT or he screwed it up twice. Uh, the uh, extortion that goes on for the rest of the people is why we doubt that there's going to be a lot of parking on the project <coughs> because CDEC, and I love the story that CDEC and DOT agree, this is not a job for CDEC to agree to. She doesn't have the authority. So there's a real problem with the memo. Number two, uh, the port, 19 April, the feasibility study and the environmental impact statement draft came out for deepening the port. Uh, they intend to go to as much as 51 feet in the entrance. Uh, currently, it's a 33, 35 foot. They intend to go up to 20, 39 feet navigation depth uh, through the channel and into the harbor. 
45 day comment period. There is a public notice out, and that's why Rabovich is probably in the same bailiwick as the rest from deepening the intercoastal to 15 feet plus two feet over depth up to 21st Street, which is the side channel that serves uh, the Viking uh, and Rabovich facility. All of that should have been brought to you for this board's comments. The um, thing I note, Mr. Chair, you're new, but if you go back into history, this business of looking at three minutes is not the way this board ought to function. It ought to be here till 10 o'clock if need be. You don't need to hurry out of here to address this mass of stuff that you have before you. Uh, in days of old, when you got to council, it's motion second without objection, next item, because this board had half the room packed with people interested in getting a better city, and we had a half a dozen items every uh, meeting for approval. You hardly have anything now. The CRA director left, not even having the, the courtesy to stay. Uh, we had a CRA meeting, I mean a, a 7-10 meeting at 5.30. Uh, the fiasco that's going on and, and 7-10 will be closed for a week beginning Saturday morning at 8 o'clock from Avenue R East to Australia. So uh, that was another DOT fiasco of just never telling anybody and it came out not in time for even being noticed at the meeting tonight. But the TV guy who works in the back does know about your request. And if you look at your minutes, you have a very clear motion and second of what was to be done. So that got out when the minutes were published for the draft form. And he says, I don't have authority to do it because it hadn't been acted upon was the answer that you want. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ward. Bessie Brown. Is, is the clock working, staff? No, the alarm is not working, so it goes to three minutes and then it just stops. Okay. And when you see 2359, that's when it's at zero. Okay, I had no clue, so go ahead, Ms. Ms. Brown. Okay, I, uh, first thing I would like to uh, mention is that uh, if Mr. Canuli or someone missed tonight that we still have fly over coming to Silver Beach Road, and is there any way we can, you know, we can get any information on that? I'd like, as a citizen, you know, to find out what's really going on with that. And uh, Ms. Davis, I, I, I you know, look, nine, nine of you there up there, and I felt so bad that she made a motion and nobody seconded for the concerns of citizens. I think that is horrible. Now, 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 if you're going to be here and work for the citizens and really work for the city, I think you should address some of the concerns that the citizens have. And uh, just as and as well as with this pollution here, you all um, city, you all have not, we're not on this board when some of this stuff went through. But basically, we have trucks coming from 45th Street. We have trucks coming down MLK, and we have trucks coming down Blue Hair. This this is a very small city that they could not channel all of these trucks to come down one area. And I think that you know I think this is wrong. Thank you. Cynthia Phillips. Good evening to the board. This is my first time really being up here and seeing you guys. This is my first time coming to one of these meetings. Um, I, I realize that you have a tough job ahead of you, and I don't know if you really realize how tough that job really is. I really think that the city not sticking to their comprehensive plan that was already sent to Tallahassee and that we said that we would follow that plan. Well, I want each board member to go and get that copy of that comprehensive plan that we sent to Tallahassee and what we told them what we were going to do, but we're doing something else. And then I want you to compare it 
took the master plan, okay? And then I want you to see the difference. We are not doing, we are not sticking to the comprehensive plan that we told Tallahassee, that's what we're going to do. I live on 21st Street, okay? And I think it's maybe three houses up over there. And the, the developers are just taking over, okay? We are surrounded by boats. That's how bad it is. I have to wake up, go to work all, all week long. Then on Saturday morning, if I want to sleep in late, I can't. Why? Because rrr, rrr, the boats, the smoke, the noise. I can't even sleep in. On a Sunday morning, I had to call the cops out. The Bureau of Beach Police Department out. So, just to give them to say, hey, it's Sunday morning. I don't want to be sleep deprived on Monday morning when I have to go back to work. So y'all are putting boats around. When we bought this house, it was residential. We bought it to live in and enjoy it. But you guys just turn it into commercial. Boom. I'm sorry, Cynthia. Your stuff is commercial now. Didn't even ask me. Because you're not sticking to the comprehensive plan. I'm looking at this right here just tonight, and I'm like, what? You don't even have my house out of here. My house is like gone as far as you're concerned. I and mean, this yellow part said, oh, this is where the residential people don't even see. So what, where am I going to be? What you going to do with me? You just going to put me out of my house? You know? You gonna enter, you're really into no the, the domain of me, although you don't talk to like that, so you don't do that anymore. So, this here tells me, you finna do something to me? And you ain't even told me. So that's why I'm telling you, you, you guys are not sticking to what you have told Tallahassee when you first did that comprehensive plan. And I know you guys are new on the board, but please look at that comprehensive plan and master plan and make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to do and not what the developers who are making rich money. They got me surrounded by boats and they don't even have permits to do the stuff they're doing over there. And the city, so go ahead and let them do it. On the weekend, you don't have permit, so why do you have a pipe? That's the only way I can get them to stop that noise. I'm talking about buzz saws and everything going. Please. You, you, you realize what y'all are doing when y'all sitting, you know, passing all this stuff? Go look at in the community and see y'all to see what's going to happen over here on 21st and all the way back down there. The developers are taking over and we are being polluted. I can't even plan a function. I want to have a, I try to have my sister law, a sister in law birthday party last weekend. She's, she was 58 years old. Excuse me, Cynthia, be mindful that the clock isn't working. I think we went okay. beyond your well, go go birthday go ahead. party because the boats were go ahead. gone, okay? I'm sorry, I went past my time. But I want you guys to start looking at what you're doing instead of just saying, yes, don't be a yes for it. Thank you. Uh, Norm Mahoney? Again, Norma Honey, 2120 Broadway. When you see the master plan, you have to be very careful when you talk about growth. I remember a long time ago, I went to Tampa. My husband and I, we had to go to a hotel over there. It was 7 o'clock in the morning. I was taking a shower, and the only thing that I, um, we paid a lot of money for the hotel, and we had drops of water. We didn't have the water running. And I asked, what's going on? Oh, you have to wait because a lot of people are taking showers right now. You have to be very careful about the water. You're talking about growth in the community? Yes, but you need to have the water. Um, you have also to check, I have, I'm sorry, you also must check if we're following the Florida status. When somebody builds something, like planning and zoning, they come here, they, they, they show up in a plan, the people know what's going to have next door in the future, and they can come and discuss about it, they agree or not. Uh, when they build something in the surrounding area, I'll, until now, since I moved here, um, 1993, the business moved to Blue Heron. 
I did never saw a permit, a paper that they always have in West Palm Beach or in any other municipality saying that, are you agreeing with the building? Are you agreeing with the site? Uh, you know, exception, whatever. My mother have a house in West Palm Beach. Guess what? I received a letter from West Palm Beach and they said that if I'm interested to go to the meeting, to give, uh, give a general exception for the new Walgreens between Southern Boulevard and Dixie Highway. And I talked to my neighbors, where I used to live before, and they said, no, that's no problem. We need something like that. Do you think I agree we talk? And I left, or I sent my letter to West Palm Beach. I say, I agree. We need a Walgreens in the, in, the, in, the, in the corner of uh, Southern Boulevard and Dixie Highway. That's what we talked. I don't even live there. I used to live there, but I still be in contact with my neighbors. So when you try to communicate to the community nothing is wrong, they go ahead and they go ahead with the process. You don't want to have in the future with no paper sent to the house and saying that I'm building something and you'll be surprised and you come here to the meetings, not the planning and zoning, hope, hoping it will be televised one day or pushing for that. Um, but the CRA and the city council and the people started behaving so bad because they were never had a communication between them and the neighbors. So of course the community is gonna be upset. So there is something that needs to be changed. But it's a fairly standard that we need to follow. Until now, I did not. If they build something or they do something, then they never let us know. So probably you can change that. Thank you. Thank you. Board comments. Mr. Chairman, first of all, I would like to thank staff for drafting it. Um, see, that far. We have been going since the turn of the century, back in the 90s, trying to get some kind of development out here in the Near Beach. One time we were talking about taking Broadway and putting the downtown area and make the Avenue East. The highway. All of those at that time were beautiful plans. But somewhere down the line, nothing came up. Somewhere, I've been on the board for 13 years, and somewhere down the line, that did not go through. And I refuse to sit on this board now and not let this go through. If people have problems with it, then work with the city to try to straighten it out. I don't care if it's the park, the trailer park, the parking, whatever it is, we can work it out. But let's don't argue, 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 and let this one die away like it did before. Let's get something done. Like the plan said when we first started, uh, you want to go? Let's do it now. And I want to do it now. Thank you. Mr. Colton. The only question or concern I would have based on public comment is are there projects that are happening within the city that is not being brought to the planning zone and board for some that possibly needs to be brought here? The projects being done such as that, it's just for my knowledge, that needs to be brought to the planning zone board that are not okay. No, that's my knowledge. Board comments. Mr. Chair, Ms. I have Jones. a couple comments. Um, everyone that's here tonight is welcome to sign up with the city to receive the information before the meeting, just like we do. There is a sign up, Jeff, you can give them the email address. Maybe that information needs to be set out along with the agenda in case there's not enough backup, backup material available where the concerned citizens that do come out can have this information, the agenda, all the backup prior to the meeting. So they're prepared. They can share it with their neighbors. Maybe they can bring some of their neighbors along with them, but just so that the information is getting out. 
mean, it's an email. So that email address can be shared with your entire community so that everyone is aware. They don't have to come in. They can email their concerns into staff. They can request that they be brought up to the board. So that is another alternative, just so everyone's aware. Um, I'll let staff go ahead and provide that information now before I go on to my next comment. Yes, um, I actively maintain the um, mailing list for any entity that's interested in receiving the packet at the same time that the board does. Um, it's my work email address, which is letter J, G, A, G, N, O, N, J, Gagnon, at Riviera, spelled R I B I E R A, which is abbreviated B C H dot com. Um, I have a couple copies of my business card here as well that has the email address on it. Thank you, Jeff. I hope everyone got that information. Um, the other thing about the board meetings being televised, that's not such a big thing for me. I would prefer to see the city money go somewhere else because I feel like if you wanted to be here, you would be here. And the people who are expressing that information to us me personally, I have not met with my new representative, my city council person, but you guys have to also, as well as expressing those concerns to us, express it to your individual council members, go out to those meetings, drop cards, stay in their face, and stay on them about that as well because they're the ones that's gonna make that decision. We're advisory, so we can pass a letter. Doesn't mean they have to do it, you guys are their constituents. You guys are the ones that are going to come to the meetings, that are going to, you know, voice your concerns. They may hear you a little louder when you're there. So just to bring that up, the other thing is if you're meeting with your council people and you're not finding that things are being moved, go up the chain. So you start on the local level. Your next level is your county level. Go and talk to your county commissioner. Go and talk to your representative. Go and talk to your senator. You're shaking your head. You're saying no, but somewhere along the process. They say no, they don't have no jurisdiction. That's why they don't want to come here and have their Point opinion. of order, please, uh, Ms. James. Okay. Um, but it's, I don't know. And if, if they don't listen to you on a local level, guess what? You have the power of a vote. So if whoever you're going to and you're speaking with and they're not listening to what you want as a citizen, they should not be in that same seat come next election time. Those are my comments. Additional comments? Mr. Hamilton. Thank you. Um, I was curious if staff could get me a copy of the comprehensive plan that was supposedly sent by uh, two Tallahassee that are neighbor Cynthia was referring to. Um, DOT is, as indicated earlier, is planning to close April 17 in Australia too. And I have concern about truck traffic going north and south on Australia during that closing, increased truck traffic. I'm hoping that could be detoured somehow some way. Um, there was supposed to be a estimated cost of putting this particular meeting on channel 18 presented, and I don't know if that was presented prior to my arrival. I have not heard anything as far as estimated cost. Um, I'm hoping that the plans that were presented can become more parking friendly for both business and residents. I understand the requirements as far as shrubs per footage or property, but in, uh, when I get my age, I don't like to walk too far anymore. So convenient parking would be a premium to me, even though the point about shading it would be nice to have a cool vehicle to go back to, no problem. And um, 
there been reference to referendum by a particular judge, and that type of information I do not have at this time, and if staff have that information, hopefully staff could provide that to me. Thank you, Chair. Oh, one other thing. There was discussion about more or less color scheme, and I don't know if the city has a particular color scheme, but if you go drive through small municipalities, you tend to see downtown areas complemented by a color scheme. And during the development stage, that's something that the board may want to consider. Thank you. Additional comments? I have a question. Mr. Dagnon, has the staff, or Mary McKinney, or whoever it would be up to, maybe it's the city council, entertained the idea of an architectural commission made up of volunteers from the public to discuss, you know, the building to address some of the issues? To date, and I'll be referencing about the past five years, I have not heard of a board of that nature being formed. The city does have some language within specific areas of the city that do have architectural guidelines and standards, which is reviewed on a staff level prior to a project going to the planning zone and board or city council. Quite honestly, I think, if I recall correctly, this is the second time tonight that the board has referenced an additional advisory board. And being a planner, I 100% support that. However, there is currently a great difficulty in maintaining boards and having adequate amount of volunteers. As you all know, we're just now at full strength, and this is the first time that the planning zone and board has been at full strength since I can remember, quite honestly. So I think the concept is a great one, and I think it's a benefit to get as much input as possible. However, using that, I guess, board scheme, it's difficult to maintain over time. Then sometimes we don't have enough business to conduct, so we don't have meetings. Maybe it's a time to think about expanding some of our responsibilities a little bit into the color schemes and what was addressed tonight, some of those items addressed. Just a thought. Additional comments? I have a question. Ms. Brooks? It's nothing to do with what we were talking about, but it's just a question that I have. Lately, I have been attending a lot of meetings in different municipalities, and they have this thing now with all the rental properties. It appears that now most of the cities are requiring that the landlords have a rental license. And what they're doing also, because of the complaints that people are living in, the living conditions of a lot of the properties the investors are buying, and they're like people just living in rat-infested places, and they're horrible. So what a lot of the cities are going to now is that they mandatory that you have a rental license, and they are making city staff inspect these properties now. And I'm just wondering, you know, when I'm in the meetings, and now the code enforcement officers are showing up in meetings and saying that, you know, if you have a property and you're a private owner, you must have a license. We're monitoring this now, and you must have us come out and inspect prior to moving a tenant in. Do we have anything? Are we looking at anything like that? Yeah. Part of the certificate of use and business accuracy process, which was revised, I want to say roughly three years ago now, it does require any rental properties to have a rental license. So the landlord would have to obtain that license, and that does allow the city to inspect the property. It allows basically any division of the city, so code enforcement, building, to weigh in on the issuance of that license. Okay. That's wonderful. Thank you. Sure. How is that enforced? I beg your pardon? How is that enforced? I don't think that's a function of the planning department, more of a code enforcement. Is that correct? What we discovered, this is both for certificate of use and business accuracy for all businesses and for rental licenses, is that the code enforcement officers are not required to have a rental license. They are required to have a business license. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
is that there were instances where people were operating without the proper documentation. In response to that, the city has, I believe, I don't know if they're full-time or temporary positions, but within our licensing division has active employees whose primary objective is to go out and ensure that the right documentation has been received by businesses and owners of rental property as well. And that also is a function of code enforcement. Is there a check and balance between, I guess, the water department, that though that an owner is operating the residence, in this case of rental property, versus a non-owner operating a property? Is there a check and balance that way? I don't know if I fully understand the question. If it was a property owner that was not... Generally, go ahead, excuse me. If a property owner was operating their own business out of their own property, that would require a business action change to be used. It would not require a rental license. However, if it was a landlord that was renting out commercial space, let's say, there is a rental license required of that property owner in addition to the business having their own SIF and use of business tax receipts. Ms. Brooks? I'm sorry, can I... Excuse me. Ms. Brooks? Just a little clarity. What I'm saying is, regardless if you're the owner of the property, if you're renting out that property, so if it's not your primary residence and you're renting it out, they're requiring them to get a license, a rental license, and they're requiring, once they apply for that license, the code enforcement department sends an inspector out to inspect and make sure that housing is not substandard. That was what I was referring to. The rental license is required of the property owner, not of the renter. Right, of the property owner. Yes. Ms. James? Okay, we have those positions with the county, with the tax collector. They're called deputy tax collectors, and they are the ones that go out and enforce to make sure businesses basically are authorized to be operating. They look at the business license. They're not going to expect the condition of the business, but just to make sure they have the proper licenses. I'm just strictly referring to rental of properties for individuals living, families living in a property. So that's only, not businesses, it's strictly families and properties. You know, one person or whatever. Additional comments? Mr. Canuti? We've had a number of questions today about the hierarchy of what governs what, and this comes up quite often in discussions here. People are a little confused as to where the CRA plan fits with the comprehensive plan, where the LDRs are, and so forth. It might be worthwhile for everybody to just have a simple diagram that says the comprehensive plan is the overriding, or Florida statute is the overriding, the comprehensive plan for the city is next. Okay? Then we've got a CRA overlay, and then you've got, you know, land development regulations, then you've got site plan approvals, then you've got building permits, et cetera, so that the process from a thought, okay, and a plan is clear on how the whole system works. No other comments? Thank you. And I do think that is actually a great idea, because sometimes I'm actually torn between the two, referring back and forth to each other. So I think at least if one of my colleagues want to make a motion to direct staff to at least provide us some sort of organizational chart with respect to land development use, the Florida statutes, the comp plan, and so forth, that would be great. I'll make a motion to direct staff to come up with a matrix that shows the hierarchy of approvals from state down to 
city through the comprehensive plan, the land development regulations, et cetera, down to the uh, building permit. And Second. And, and, and let me understand, that was direct staff to create a matrix of hierarchy. Well, to create a, a, a hierarchy of plans on what governs what, essentially. Properly moved and second. Roll call. Roll call. <clears throat> Marie Davis. Yes. Shea Brooks. Yes. Julius Wiggum? Yes. Renee James? Yes. Edward Canuti? Yes. Brian Colton? Yes. Tragic McCoy? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, thank you. Um, I actually have a few things, and uh, I don't know where to start because it's quite a bit. But uh, I have a question for staff. As, as far as, and, and I'll go back to this whole about the Channel 18. I think what happened, we had our meeting on April 11th, and somewhere about when I was reviewing the notes, I noticed that that motion actually directed me instead of staff. So I called in on the 16th of April, and I, I think I spoke to Brad and I think the onus was back on me because I did get a reply back email from Jeff, so uh, it did end with me and I didn't follow up, so that's my, my apologies on that. But my question is, as far as that's concerned, the reason I called back was I wanted to find out what was the time frame on, I don't know who it, who does this, but transcribe the minutes. I mean, how from, I guess, from the end of our meeting, which would have been the 11th, I mean, is it two weeks' time? or And I'm sure that administering and facilitating these meetings isn't the only function of the planning department, but, you know, what's the time frame on when that can be turned around? Because I was going to refer back to that, but it was not quite available a week later. Yeah, um, we will always have the minutes. Let me, let me start with, I don't want to say always. But let me put Kevin in as we prepare our own meeting minutes based off of the recordings. That's not the house. It's not the third party entity involved. Um, we always strive to have the meeting minutes available to go out with the package for the next meeting. Um, so they can be reviewed at least a week in advance. Um, occasionally, they're done prior to that, but seldomly, they uh, don't make that time frame. But staff just strive to have them done at least um, in time to go up with the agenda package, which is a week before. Right, and I, and I think that's a that's a bit lengthy, and I, and again, I don't want to you know overwhelm you guys, but it seems like you said a week before the next meeting, so that would give three weeks time. Am I accurate in saying that? About give or take a few days, but about three weeks time. Depending this this particular instance that was a shorter time period. Right, right, and being that we had the workshop and so forth. Now, doesn't and, and this is a question I don't know who would better ask to, uh, answer this. Doesn't city council actually utilize some sort of technology that automatically transcribes the minutes? Because I, I don't imagine, I've actually went to the, the council minutes and I've seen hundreds of pages and I just know no one could have possibly went through and transcribed all of those minutes. It, it, doesn't the city clerk use that sort of te technology? To my knowledge, I believe the city council has the minutes professionally transcribed. I know the CRA does. I can verify exactly how they're produced, and if it is something as simple as software, if it's effective, then that would be a great solution. Certainly. I, I think we do fall in the, within the realms of being a part of the city, and if that's something that's available to them, I, I mean, I wonder if it's something that we can utilize here on the board that'll make it a, well. a, a, yeah, a much more efficient process. Now, does that require a motion on our part, or is that something no, I, that... I can, I can look into how to Okay, certainly. Uh, uh, I, I did hear some of the comments that my colleagues make, and, and you know I can definitely concur. And one thing I must say is that we are advisory in nature. And sometimes when I uh, I, I get people to ask me some off the wall questions regarding you know what my duties is on the being a member of the planning and zoning board, I'm like you know I'm not code enforcement. I mean I can't walk up to anyone and say hey uh, you know that is not a, in, that's not consistent with the ordinance of the city or what have you. But, but what I'll say is this, I, I can definitely appreciate those folks that came in today 
saying about the agenda wasn't there, but you know, at least as far back as I can remember, maybe the last four or five meetings, there hasn't been anybody in here but members and staff. So I, you know, I can't possibly put the burden on staff to sit here and create 30 meeting packets when you only have one individual that shows up in the meeting. So you know, I think we have to be a little mindful of you know the efficiency process. Now I, I do think they should be available, and, and am I correct? They are online, right? Aren't, aren't, aren't these the agenda and the backup is online? Okay, great. And um, chain of command. I actually, uh, and, and I don't know if it's something that staff is quite prepared to uh, speak to, but interesting enough, in, in the process, I heard Ms. James mention, you know, you should reach out to your council people, and then if not there, then, you know, move up the chain to your county elected officials and so forth to your state representative. And I have the honor of working with the state representative, and I know one of the major issues regarding the 710 project, what we heard about was the wall, and that's been an ongoing concern of the, you know, the residents in that area. Well, I know, uh, and, and I have a letter back from Governor Scott that was actually forwarded to me uh, from one of the DOT personnel, and, and, and then I, I would definitely say this. I mean, it, I think you have to resort to reaching out to not only your city officials, but your county officials and your state officials. And we even had the privilege of having members from city council and the manager, city manager, come up to Tallahassee and visit us, as well as the mayor. And I know one of the things that the mayor mentioned when he was there was the 710 project, and he made it his business to go over and speak to the top guy of the Department of Transportation in Tallahassee. And, and I know that there was a resolution done by the city, and, and, and I'll just read just a portion of what, what the letter says because it's pretty uh, detailed, and I'm, I, you know, I can't disseminate exactly everything it says. But it says, and, and this is addressed to Mayor Thomas Masters, your requested, excuse me, and it's a little difficult to read it off of the phone, but it says, you requested by letter of April 8th to Governor Scott by Resolution 3213 that the Florida Department of Transportation reevaluate provisions of Norris walls on Martin Luther King Boulevard, State Road 17, and Riviera Beach. We have done so and determined that there are some sections of 12-foot tall noise walls can be qualified. We have also determined that it is appropriate where the department has the available right-of-way to offer a six-foot concrete wall for homes adjacent to State Road 17. And, and a little bit further down, and, I, and I'm not going to read every detail in this letter, it says, we find it reasonable for FDOT to offer a six-foot wall, concrete wall, six-foot tall concrete wall at the property line or adjacent to the frontage road to shield all homes along State Road 17 between Avenue U and Old Dixie Highway. All of these walls will be constructed as part of the future construction project to begin in autumn of 2015. We have not yet designed the details of this concept, but we'll follow the plan detailing the potential location of these walls. And it goes on, and it gets a little more technical, but that's beyond me at this point. But but I do, again, concur with what Ms. James said. I mean, you you, you got to kind of be vigilant, and I hated that all these individuals that, that made such nice comments have uh, since left the chambers, but you have to be vigilant, and, and I do appreciate the public comment portion, because we do only have three minutes, Mr. Wards, and, and, and you know, I want to be mindful that this is an advisory board and staff, but it, it, it doesn't end here, and I don't want, you know, anyone to come in and think that we have the sole discretion in determining what goes on in the city. We only are advisory in nature, so I, I think everyone should be mindful of that, and, and again, I uh, was sitting here thinking about the Channel 18. I am going to do the letter tonight, and in fact, and, and I don't know if the city manager's schedule permit, but I'll, I, I'll try to give her a call in the morning and see if this is something that uh, she could possibly meet me before I'm out of here for uh, before I leave this weekend. And uh, okay, I think that's pretty much it. My question. I, I have one more question, uh, and this is for. This is for staff regarding, and I don't know if Miss Anthea is still there, but you talked about bringing it back, and I, I'm just hopeful that it's not going to be May 9th because that just gives us two weeks, and I don't think that's appropriate for for anyone on this board. I mean, I know we got this information a week ago, you know, and we did propose, you know, a couple suggestions, and there were some things that was a little questionable that I heard, you know myself and some of the other members up here on the board bring up. I just think it's a little soon. And, and I want to, Jeff, I want to kind of figure out, and, and this has been one of my concerns I've, I've seen in the past, when we make suggestions to this draft language and, these, and, and draft ordinances and things that regulate uh, land use, 
I mean, every detail item we have to make into a motion that, like, for instance, I remember when we did something about, uh, like, for instance, today when we brought up the trailer parks. Is that going to be something that Ms. Anthea is going to bring back specifically that's going to address that one thing? Or are we to make a motion now for each individual individual item that we, we you know we have questions with because sometimes I've, I've you know asked for clarification on things and we send things back well yeah one thing has changed now you know one of the other members might notice something new on it and then here we are that process starts again and we have to send it back to you guys to go and work on and you know do it, it do what you do and then comes back and then you know that process runs sometimes you know two three and even I've seen four meetings and I don't want the public to get the perception that we're trying to stifle progress. But I, I, I do understand that we should, and, and I've heard people say it, you know, it, it's really our responsibility. So I want to make sure as thorough as possible, at least, you know, what, what, what our opinion is and what our position is as a board. So, I mean, how can we better arrange that? Because the process sometimes is very lengthy and I want to make sure as thorough as, as possible. Okay, so I, I, I mean, I hope everyone understands that I, I, we're directed to make a motion for every item that we think is going to be a concern, at least just so that we are, uh, in fact, you know, we, we make sure we cover our bases. So, okay, I, I, I can appreciate that. I just don't want to, you know, drag this out and have ang angry individuals in the community as if we're stifling progress. documents in the past is that when I come back to you, and it will probably not be the ninth, um, I'll try, the staff will help me to make sure that I hit every comment that we had tonight, and I'll give you the comment, and I'll explain why it was adjusted, why it wasn't adjusted, go back to the master plan if that needs to be sh sh documented or shown again. We'll try to really make it as user-friendly as we can, because it is complicated, but um, We'll definitely work together, and then hopefully in the end, we'll have something that you can move approval with the changes as listed, and we'll list it when, when we think we're getting close to a motion on the screen, and then you can edit it. That's the way that we handle the comprehensive plan, and that's the way we handle the series. So I'm hoping that we can try to make it as painless as possible. If they, if they are complicated documents. And I'm, I was a little surprised at some of the comments because I thought that they had been Thank you. I appreciate that, Ms. Cynthia. Anything additional for our uh, as staff to about their project updates? Mr. Canuti. Yeah, just one uh, comment. Having gone through this process a, a few times, I think it worked pretty well with Treasure Coast and staff, you know, in uh, adding our comments and getting adjusted into the into the, the next document. And it is a complicated document that that uh, needs to, you know, needs to warrants the time to, to get it right, you know. 
I think what a lot of people fail to see is that some of the some of the things that they object to when a specific project comes along really <coughs> need to be addressed two or three uh, phases prior, like in the comprehensive plan, because we get to the point where, you know, at some point somebody has actual property rights, you know, uh, because of the plan. So, uh, so I think the, you know, this is a vote of confidence. I think they did a good job with, uh, in the past of uh, having done this. No other comments. Thank you, uh, Mr. Colton. Did you have a comment? Yeah, just a uh, um, couple of comments. If I may, I could give a copy of type job for staff. Um, the second <clears throat> comment is if I may have asked a question, I'm not sure if that was being referred to, but if anyone, if there's some new people here on the board that may or may not be true to some of the past, and I'm one of them, so I'll ask some questions just for clarification. All right, any more comments? All right, staff, project updates and upcoming projects. So we've, we've had some brief discussion on this item and whether or not it's coming for a board or not. It sounds that the board wishes for additional time to review the document. Um, I guess we'll, uh, we'll weigh all the options. Again, there's no We've been getting a lot of calls about Popeyes, and you may have seen that Popeyes is gone, but in case you didn't know, you're getting a brand new Popeyes with the whole brand new building, brand new everything. Um, the parking lot will basically be the same, except for you'll have a one-way entrance in off the blue area, and then the exit will be out. 